even if you're many years past service, one of the things that they're going to look at is, did you continue to get medical care? Because one of the elements that they're going to be looking at in assessing your claim is the potential severity of the claim. Welcome to the Victory Over VA podcast. A podcast about empowering veterans to overcome denied disability claims. Each week, we deliver critical insights to help you understand the disability process, veterans' benefits, and how to take control of your legal rights. Now here's your host, Tony Francis Jackson. Hello. Today we're talking about the third commandment. Continue to treat throughout your claim. And I'd like to start by welcoming you to Victory Over VA, your guide to winning VA disability benefits. If you're a veteran who is in need of veterans' benefits, or the family of a veteran, or even the close friend of a veteran who needs support, this is the place for you to be. Our podcast goes every week, and we give you the latest in VA disability benefits. All right. Well, as you said, this week, the third commandment, uh, heal thoroughly. Now, what, just as a starting point, what is the purpose of, you know, continuing medical care uh, even after you've submitted your application? Well, it helps to give this a little context. When a claim is submitted to the VA, they look at a lot of different facets in the claim. One of the facets that they look at is what's called continuity of care. And what that really focuses on is whether you've had consistent medical care for this particular condition that you're claiming. And they will look all the way back to the time you point to in the service as the basis for this claim. But even if you're many years past service, one of the things that they're going to look at is, did you continue to get medical care? And they're going to look at that because one of the elements that they're going to be looking at in assessing your claim is the potential severity of the claim. And, you know, it it stands to just common sense. If you don't go to the doctor for five years about a particular problem, it's much easier for someone at the VA to say, gee, it can't have been that big a problem or you would have been going to the doctor about it. So it's very important to go to the doctor regularly even if you think that the doctor isn't curing your problem. Nonetheless, for purposes of your claim, it's important because it establishes that the problem continues and it's severe enough that you're treating for it. So um, that's a critical piece in establishing the severity of the claim. Gotcha. Now, how does that apply in, um, a, you know, for instance, a, a condition like a, like a back problem? I see, you know, a lot of veterans with low back claims and some days are good and then some days they're debilitating flare-ups. You know, your doctor's appointment scheduled for a good day what if you go in and the, and the doctor's saying, oh, asymptomatic, something like that? Well, the, uh, it, it's still important to go, and let me explain why. If you go to the doctor and it's a good day and you're, you, know, you, you have a, what the doctors will describe as a normal range of motion, normal gait, all those uh, little things that they put in the report, it's important for you to go and to explain to the doctor, so it gets in the records, that last week, For three days, you couldn't get out of your easy chair because your back was so bad you could barely hobble to the bathroom. And it's that kind of evidence consistently over time that helps to demonstrate to the VA both that you really do have a problem and that the problem is severe enough that uh, you should be entitled to benefits for it. Gotcha. And so I guess the same could be said for conditions like... uh, Uh, migraine headache. I know a lot of vets who have like a TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury, they'll also be like a migraine component. 
So would the same, same sort of rationale apply there? Actually, it's even more important in, in migraine cases. Uh, one of the biggest problems with VA is it's hard for them to rate things they can't see. You know, I, I, just as an example, if you uh, and a buddy were in Iraq and you're both in a Humvee and one of these improvised explosive devices, IEDs, goes off and blows the heck out of the Humvee and your buddy loses his foot and you get a concussion and a TBI, the VA will not have any trouble rating his claim. They can see that he's lost his foot. They can figure out what the proper rating is. His claim will go quite quickly and smoothly in 99% of the cases. One, once in a while, there'll be some weird piece that they have trouble with. But, but those kinds of cases that they can see, those move along. But things like a traumatic brain injury, migraine headaches, stuff that they can't see, that they can't get an x-ray for, that they can't get an MRI for, those are the claims that are so hard because the VA has it set up in a way that they're not frequently willing to take the veteran's word for it. They want external proof, and it's very hard to provide external proof of those kinds of conditions. As, as medicine gets more sophisticated, with TBIs, for example, there are now neuropsychological tests that help to demonstrate those claims. But migraine headaches, you know, there's no way for a doctor to measure a migraine headache. An experienced doctor who looks at someone who's having a migraine will recognize the symptoms. They'll recognize the, the pain behavior. They'll, they'll be able to say, boy, this person is having a migraine. But you can't measure it. There's, there's nothing, you know, you can't take a blood test, you can't take an x-ray. There's nothing that you can present to the VA as an objective measure that this person is having a terrible migraine. If you're there and you see the person, you can probably figure out that they're in, they're in pain in some particular way. And, you know, if you're an experienced doctor and you recognize that if you separate them from anything that causes sound and you turn out the lights that they do better, it's probably a migraine. But it's, it's just one of those difficult areas in, in VA practice where conditions like mental health conditions, TBIs, migraines, and a lot of uh, gastrointestinal kinds of problems that, that can't be easily quantified with testing mm. are very difficult for the VA and it's critically important to get consistent medical treatment over time. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, you know, it's just as important for, for our veterans to be active and engaged participants in these medical appointments as it is to show up at the appointment. Well, that's true. Uh, you always want to advocate for yourself at medical appointments by telling the doctor, you know, these are the symptoms I've had since I saw you last. This is the, the nature of the problem that is most bothersome. Um, you know, if the doctor has prescribed medication and it doesn't seem to be efficacious, then you need to be speaking up about that. And unfortunately, one of the really sad things that happens is a lot of our veterans get trapped in this, what some people would call a military mindset, where I'm gonna push through, I'm gonna overcome, I'm not gonna let this hold me back. And they, they have the, the traditional British stiff upper lip, I don't complain about my symptoms, I don't talk about my symptoms. And that's not what you need to be doing with your claim. You need to be frank with your doctor on every occasion and say, yep, this is still going on, this is how it's bothering me, this is the terrible time I had last week, or, you know, I'm really in pain today, but unfortunately, some veterans are very, very reluctant to voice those kinds of complaints. They think it's um, unmanly or uh, inconsistent with military tradition to complain and, and what they view as whine, but it isn't whining when you're telling your doctor what's going on with your condition. And it's really, really important for people to understand that and to convey that. Gotcha. Now, I imagine that, you know, mental health 
psychi psychiatric conditions in particular would be, you know, a, a diagnoses where you would want to be very clear and consistent with your care. Is, I mean, is that accurate or is, you know, a stressor in service that's confirmed, is that enough to carry a case? Well, you know, <laughs> all of the above. The problem with mental health is that for most people, their mental conditions wax and wane. Some, some days they're worse, some days they're better. You know, I, I have represented a lot of veterans over the years and uh, one of the conditions that's very common is depression either uh, depression as the major claim or depression that comes from being debilitated and not being able to do the things you want to do, not being able to work and support your family, just not being functional anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to A, do your best to get that treated just so you can function better, but B, uh, for, for strictly claim purposes, it's important to document that this is a consistent problem, that it's not just, oh, I was feeling a little blue last week, but you know, I'm fine today. I've been fine for the last, you know, five years. You know, it is important to document, as with anything with the government, it's important to document that the problem is ongoing and that it is at least periodically severe. So you know, another aspect of this, of this uh, continuous, consistent, ongoing care is the relationship you're building with your medical provider. Can you explain a little bit about how, um, you know, having a medical provider who understands what you're going through, who has, has a longitudinal, uh, long-term view of, of your conditions, how that can be a, a real boon uh, for a disability claim? It certainly can. And the, the way that works, the VA in most cases looks at medical evidence to decide the claim. That's a, a critical component in every claim. And one way they typically do that is with what are called compensation and pension exams. They'll send a veteran for a one-time examination and the examiner Sometimes gets it right, sometimes they don't. It, you know, it's like anything else. Um, medicine is more art than science in many ways, particularly when it comes to mental health. But the importance of having a doctor that you've seen consistently and who has followed your claim over time is that that doctor will be able to focus in on the aspects of your claim, the aspects of your condition, that are most disabling for you. You know, if you put depression up in the dictionary or uh, look it up on Google or whatever, you'll find that there are multiple symptoms uh, that fall in that general category. And it's always important in a particular case to determine what symptoms are actually applicable to this individual veteran and how do they affect him because that will determine not only eligibility, but also the severity of the claim and ultimately the kind of rating that should be applied. And for many veterans, even those whose problems are heavily physical problems, the weight of that, the physical problems over time, you know, the inability to uh, go and uh, play ball with your kids, the inability to uh, go and enjoy a, a camping vacation with your wife, mm -hmm. the inability to just do a 40 hour a week job and support your family, those things tend to weigh on people in such a way that it becomes actually the most disabling element in the entire disability picture, even though it's coming from physical causes because ultimately it just wears people down. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important to have a doctor who's seen you over time and has been able to, to see how the symptoms develop and progress and where they're at currently, not only for determining service connection, but also for determining severity of the claim. Now, you know, for some vets I've, I've worked with, 
you know, they're, they're going to the doctor, but it seems like there's a new treatment, a new prescription every couple of months. Nothing, you know, nothing's really helped. Why, why is it still important for, for veterans to, you know, comply with the treatment in good faith, take the medications as prescribed, uh, you know, that kind of thing? Well, there are really two reasons. I mean, the first and most important reason is the next treatment may be the one that really works. That's, you know, the truly most significant part for, for people's lives. Mm. But, but turning... I'm sure everybody would much rather be well and healthy and capable than be getting a check from the VA. I, I think you can count on that. Yeah. But, but putting that aside, in terms of, of just the focus of the claim, you know, the thing that the VA focuses in on a lot is they're attempting to determine how severe a particular condition is. And if your doctor is writing, oh, Jones decided he wouldn't take medication anymore. Uh, Jones decided he wouldn't try this new um, behavioral treatment. Jones decided that he wasn't going to uh, come to group therapy anymore. You know, those are things that no matter how legitimate your reasoning is for doing them, the VA will try to seize on those as demonstrating that your claim is not severe or in some cases that your claim is resolved and there's no entitlement to ongoing benefits at all, never mind at a reduced level of severity. So it's, it's important to do your best to work with your doctor, A, to try to get better, but B, also to make it clear to the VA that the problem hasn't just gone away. And Sadly, I see lots of cases where the veteran just gets tired. They just, they've been going to therapy, they've been going to take medication, they've been going to try, to try different treatments, and nothing works. And they just get depressed to a point that they, they don't have the energy to try something new. Yeah. And that's, A, not good for them as a person, but uh, not good for their claim either. And that actually, uh, uh, you know, dovetails with, with what I wanted to ask about next. How, um, I know a lot, of, a lot of our veterans and, you know, a significant number of, of our own clients at Jackson McNichol uh, struggle with substance abuse problems, uh, alcoholism, other substances, things like that. How does consistent ongoing medical care help when dealing with with substance abuse issues and how uh, those can impact a claim for disability benefits? Sure. Well, obviously, if the person is unable to work simply because they're overindulging in alcohol or drugs or some combination thereof, the VA is not going to treat that as a service-connected disability. But if the person is suffering from those conditions as a way of trying to deal with a mental health condition. Self-medicating. That's the, that's the phrase, yes. If, if that's what's going on, the only way that it's going to be possible to convince the VA of that is by ongoing regular treatment and at least reasonable efforts to try to control the substance use and to minimize its impact to the greatest extent possible. I mean, the VA is not allowed to turn someone down, say, for PTSD or depression or anxiety merely because they're also um, using alcohol or drugs to try to um, numb themselves, feel more normal, whatever. But if that isn't clear from the medical evidence that the problems with drugs or alcohol or both are a result of other problems. Yeah, uh, but for the, the medical conditions or the, the, you know, the mental health condition, the physical injury that existed, you know, there wouldn't be the substance abuse. That's right. Okay. And that's, that's what the medical records have to portray. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing, and yeah, I've seen this happen in a number of cases, where a CMP examiner who is looking at the person one time 
will ascribe their problems to use of alcohol, use of drugs, um, some combination of the two. But the treating personnel will recognize that, yes, there's a problem here with substances, but that's not the cause. Mm -hmm. The cause is that this person is suffering from bipolar disorder or depression or anxiety, uh, and that's the reason. You know, I, I had a case a few years ago, not a veteran's case, but a social security disability case, where the gentleman was drinking very heavily to the point that his doctor essentially said, you've got to stop drinking or you're going to die. And I was talking to the particular person um, in preparation for a hearing we were getting ready to do. And I asked him about it. I said, you know, your, your doctor says this is really bad. It, it's going to kill you. And he said, you know, my anxiety is so bad that I would rather die sooner and not be as anxious. And he said, you know, I've tried all the medications they've prescribed, mm -hmm. and none of them has had as much an effect as alcohol. Mm -hmm. And sadly enough, we got him benefits, but uh, a few years later he did die. But he, he made a conscious choice that mm -hmm. he was not going to stop using alcohol despite its deleterious effects, because it was the only thing that gave him relief from this terrible, terrible anxiety that he suffered. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wanted to, to tease out part of, of what you were talking about, because it sounds like getting you know, consistent, ongoing medical care can even help uh, uh, overcome a bad CMP exam. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Unlike uh, Social Security, the VA doesn't have a rule that treating physicians get any kind of special treatment, and the Social Security has now abrogated that rule as well, but, but they had it for a long time. But regardless of that, the VA does recognize that a treating physician, someone who sees you consistently over time, probably has a better grasp of what's going on with your physical and mental health um, than a CMP examiner who only sees you one time and typically is not given much mm -hmm. by way of records um, to examine to uh, to help them to understand the case. I mean, uh, um, in many of these CMP exams, the the doctor will have access only to your VA file, not necessarily to any outside healthcare, and probably will not have time to read it. It's sad, but the way these exams are contracted, the examiner has a relatively small period of time on any given case. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, uh, a large file with lots of medical, the truth is they're not going to read it all. They, they, you know, the conscientious ones will do their best to, to try to find the high points at least, but mm -hmm. some of them won't even look at it. It's, it's very important to offset a bad CMP exam to have something from the person who's treating you on a consistent basis explaining why the factors that the CNP examiner picked up on are not the critical factors and that the true critical factors are something else. Okay. And just a reminder for our viewers, CNP is compensation and pension. I know we can get mired in, uh, in, in jargon sometimes, yes. in jargon, yeah. Well, um, we're, we're running out of time for today, but did you have any last uh, uh, comments that you might want to make on the importance of, of consistent and ongoing medical care for, for veterans as they go through the disability claim process? No, I think we've hit all the high points. I, I would just summarize by saying that it is important to continue to get medical care, work closely with your doctor, and try not to get too frustrated with um, VA system where sometimes there's a lot of turnover with treating folks. Uh, there can be delays in between getting new treating folks. Try to just grit your teeth and stay with it, stay with the treatment, and be consistent in your treatment. All right. Well, this has been another uh, exciting episode of Victory Over VA with uh, Mr. Francis Jackson veterans disability attorney. I'm Christian Terrison, another attorney here at Jackson and McNichol. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe and uh, tune in for our next episode. Come back for our next podcast. Take care.
Thanks for joining us this week on the Victory Over VA podcast. Make sure to visit our website, veteransbenefits.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes, or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like this show, you might want to check out our free consultation to see how we can help you with your denied claim. Simply go to veteransbenefits.com and fill out the form. You fought for us. Now let us fight for you. And be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.